Happy Monday to everybody. Shavua Tov. Hope everybody had a nice Shabbos and a nice Sunday. Hope everybody is well and healthy and safe. I'll begin this morning by uh, expressing gratitude to we have two sponsors, those who generously co-sponsored our contemporary cases in uh, Shas Shir this morning. First, thank you to A.B. and Don Pomerantz in commemoration of the first yard site of his beloved mother, Chavi Pomerantz, Chava Rachel Basa Kiva. Chava Rochel Basakiva, the first yard site. Her neshama should have an aliyah, and in the merit of learning together, it should be a merit as host for your entire family. Thank you so much for your sponsorship. And likewise, it is co-sponsored as well by Avram Hillel, Hillel and Chaya Reich, commemoration of the yard site of her beloved father, Bernard Glickman, Berleib Ben Chaim Pesach, and his beloved grandmother, Fanny Bulletin, Esther Freda Bas, Rav Avram. Their neshama should have an aliyah as well. Thank you so much for your generous sponsorship. It should also likewise be a schus, a merit for your entire family. Okay, let's get going. So let's explore a fascinating case uh, this morning. But by way of introducing this case, I want to start with a few psukim as a little bit of background. We know that within the space of a single pusik, the Chumash, the Torah, twice refers to the night of the Seder as Leil Shimurim. What does Leil Shimurim literally mean? It means the night that is guarded. Now, there's a lot of interpretation of what it means that the night is guarded. It's a night that's guarded by HaKadosh Baruch Hu to take Bnei Yisrael out of Mitzrayim. This night remains to Hashem, a night that is guarded throughout the Dardaras, throughout the generations. That's from Exodus chapter 12, Pusik, 30, uh, Pusik 42, Mem- Membez from Parsha's bow. Now there's a lot of different discussions from the Chachamim commentaries as to what in fact this Pesach means. What does it mean, Leil Shimurim, the night that is guarded? So let's begin first with Rashi. Rashi explains, and this is going to all set up the case that we're going to study together, that Leil Shimurim means, according to Rashi, that what it means that it's a night of anticipation, it's a night of waiting, it's a night of watchfulness, why? Because what it means that HaKadosh Baruch Hu guarded and anticipated this night when he would fulfill, you know, his guarded promise and take B'nai Sol out of Mitzrayim. 210 years with slaves and enslaved in Egypt. The Brisbane of Isarim, the covenants of the parts that the pact that was uh, forged between Avram Avinu and HaKadosh Baruch Hu, that it was true, we were going to, gonna, gonna have to descend into a land that was foreign to Mitzrayim, to Egypt. But now the promise to take us out, it was time for that promise to be fulfilled. So that's what Rashi explains what it means, Leil Shimurim. It's anticipation. It's anticipation of and waiting for that situation whereby HaKadosh Baruch Hu's promise would be fulfilled. That's one idea. But we understand what that is, a night that is set aside. It wasn't just random, but it was set aside for a twofold redemption. Now, who is that redemption for? Other commentaries explain that there was a... Geula, obviously for the nation, for Bnei Yisrael, for the people, but there's also a gula uh, for Kodesh Baruch Hu. What does it mean? A gula, for, a geula, a redemption for Kodesh Baruch Hu. And this is some um, explain that this is what it means. Leil Shimurim. Leil Shimurim. It means that there's a double lashon. It's plural Shimur. It's not Leil Shimur. It's not one night of watch. But it's a night of watch, which is not now, but also the Doros. So we see that throughout the period of bondage of slavery, it's as if the divine presence was also enslaved. That's what the Alkid Shimoni writes in his commentary on these psukim. Now, whenever it is that Bnei Yisrael, the Jewish people, are in exile, so the Shechina, Kaviyochel as well, went with them to exile also. We understand that this is true from a variety of different sources, but the Yalkut is one of the more famous ones in the Medrash, which explains that Ima Anochi Vitzara means that when God feels our pain, when God feels our exile, our exile is not just that he sees it from afar, but he goes into exile as well. The fact that there's no Beis HaMikdash, the fact that the temple is in ruins, the fact that the temple was destroyed, the fact that we yearn for it to be rebuilt is in part our burning desire for us to take God out, if you will, of exile. His Shechina is in exile. Now, obviously, God is wherever he wants it to be, whenever he wants it to be. But su- suffice it to say, in our earthly understanding of what it means in exile, there's no Beis HaMikdash. There's no place for God's Shechina, his divine presence to reside. And by us being redeemed, and by him being redeemed, so that's the dual language, the double plural language of Leil Shimurim. That's how the Yalkut is to be understood, specifically to Rashi. It's a night of redemption. It's a night of fulfilling of promise. It's a promise that's fulfilled for us as a people, but it's also a promise that's fulfilled insofar that we take God out of exile. And actually, 
I remember discussing this on Tisha B'av. One of the things that we're davening for with the base of Mikdash to be rebuilt, if it's not even for our own sake, but it's for your lamancha, for your sake. We want you to be out of exile. We want there to be Hashras Hashchin. We want there to be to, there to be a divine revelation, a divine understanding, a feeling, and a deep appreciation of God's presence in the world. Okay, so that's this first idea that is coupled with this interpretation of the Yalkut Shimoni. Others explain when it says, Leil Shimurim, a night that's guarded, Lodorodoros, it's a night that's reserved for the Geula Asida, which is the future redemption, which is what we're yearning for, which is what we want. It wasn't just the Geula as Mitzrayim, the redemption from Egypt. Why is it that this word, again, Shimurim is repeated? Because on this night, in other times and other places, HaKadosh Baruch Hu did great things. Great things for the tzaddikim, great things for our people, just like what was done in Mitzrayim. And so we also, Davin, we pray that it should be that we should have a geula shlema, that Nisan, the Gemara tells us, the month of Nisan is the month of redemption. It's a nice, the, the month of, of salvation. And so therefore, just like the Jews were in Egypt were saved, so to, from our current exile, it will come to a screeching halt as well. Then there's the opinion in the Shulchan Aruch and Archaim in chapter 481, where the explanation of Leil Shimura means it's, it's a night on which there is protection from, from uh, various and certain harmful elements. Now, what are those harmful elements? We'll get into that right now. But for this reason, the Shulchan Aruch says that, you know, every night we say the Kriya Shema Al Hamita, which means we say the entire totality of the three paragraphs of the Shema at night, which we should always do anyway after the Zman of Tzitzit Kachavim. But the the night of the hour of halachic nightfall, but what we also understand is that there's something called there's a you can you know buy these cards you can look in a sitter that it's what's called kriya shema lamita which is a compilation of a variety of different sections of tefilos tchunim various uh, prayers that are recited that are against the mazike halayla that against the harmful elements of the night we say kriya shema lamita we say three paragraphs say yoshe b'seser Elyon, certain capital of Tehillim, certain Yirat sons, things of that sort. We ask for Kadush Baruch Hu's protection that are usually said, these tefillahs before a person goes to sleep. Now, the Shulchan Aruch writes that on this night, it's Leil Shimurim, these harmful elements are held at bay. They are not released to do their harm. Hopefully no one should have harm any night. But at least on this night, for sure, we're told that Kadush Baruch Hu holds back these harmful elements, specifically to Leil Shemurim, according to Shulchan Aruch, and so therefore the obligation is only to read the first paragraph of the Shema, because on this night we enjoy this special protection. It's a Leil Shemurim, we're very thankful that we don't, we don't have to anguish and worry like we would have to do, and so therefore only the first paragraph. That's that. And lastly, and this is going to be what kind of transitions us into our case here this morning, there are those who understand, the Maiser Okeach and many others, that he heard of a great sage and various chachamim over the generations that would never lock the doors of their home on this night. And there's a lot of different conversation. There's a Magen Avram, maybe you should lock it but not bolt it. We're going to get into a little bit of that. And we'll see that w- which situations arrive if there are situations that are unpredicted as it relates to Geneva, thievery, theft, negligence, things of that nature, which we'll get to that. But the commentaries say that maybe there are those who over the years, over the generation, the span of time, they never locked their doors. Is there some level of this fulfillment of this Pasuk, if it's Leil Shimurim, and you really feel safe and safeguarded, and you feel protected, so then it's not necessary for you to like, lock your door. Locking your door is just an indication of you maybe not feeling protected, so therefore it's a manifestation of feeling protected. And there are th- some who... By, by extension to this, obviously, not only do they not lock their doors, there's some people that leave their doors open even a little bit, a little crack, so that when we go out to greet Eliyahu Hanavi, right, we know that we're destined to be redeemed, some say, according to some commentaries, not only in the month of Nisan, but actually the night of Pesach. It's a night that's guarded and reserved for Geula ever since my separations, according to some commentaries in the Midrashim. So what we understand is not only it's unlocked, but the door's open, your uh, Mashiach bag is packed. You're ready to go. You realize as an expression of your trust in the Almighty's delivery of the promise, so you realize that it can happen. How do you recognize that your faith should be proven? Your faith is proven not by you bolting the door, or triple locking the door, or keeping the door open is actually a better way of expressing perhaps your faith in this idea. So we see that this is just kind of some. There are a little bit more 
but these are kind of like the basics as it relates to just learning what does it mean, Leil Shimurim? What does it mean that it's the night of watch? The different commentaries of what it is and how to fulfill this. Is it just simply a statement or are there are actually things that you have to do? And again, some people, what they do is they don't triple bolt their, do- their doors, their locks, they leave their doors unlocked, or in so- some will actually even go so far as to even keep their doors open slightly ajar as a manifestation of this time and this idea of Leil Shimurim. And that brings us really to our case here. That was really just a little bit of a hakdama. Any question on that, I guess, before we get to the, the nuts and bolts of what we're going to study today? Maybe you've heard some of that before, but if not, it certainly sets the, 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 uh, the table for what we're going to study here now. So if you look at the source sheet that I had uh, uh, prepared for you, it's in the chat as well, if you haven't seen it yet, <coughs> it's as follows. We are understanding in uh, Simon, Shin, Yud, Aleph, and the case uh, that is appropriate for the holiday of Pesach, which we're studying, we're learning together, is the following. This is a situation where person will no base of Belel HaSeder. He understood that this which we just learned, and he decides he's going to express his his appreciation for this as a Leil Shimur, a night of redemption, so he doesn't lock his door at night. The Ganvu es HaPikadon Shebebeso. And what happens is he, something that was kept safe in his house, which was it was understood that he was going to watch it, so it was stolen from his house. And now the question, of course, then becomes, who is obligated? Maybe there's a certain sense of responsibility insofar that somebody asked you to hold something, somebody asked you to watch something. So if somebody asked you to watch something, what is your responsibility to do so? So look at this case where he explains the following. There was one case, so, that there was something to watch that was left in somebody's house. You gave somebody a pikadon. What's a pikadon? Some type of article, some type of chefza, some type of um, object, some type of anything that belonged to somebody else. And somebody says to you, you know, do me a favor. Can you please keep this in your house as, as a favor? You're going to watch it for me. I'm going to keep it. And I'll come retrieve it at a certain date, a certain time. And it was left in somebody's house. Vahaya Shomrechinam. Now we know that there are different types of watchmen. A watchman is there's someone called a Shomer Sachar, there's someone called a Shomrechinam. What's a Shomer Sachar? Shomer Sachar is very clear that I'm hiring you, I'm, I'm, I'm engaging in your services, I'm going to pay you for watching, for doing what I need you to do. So I'll pay X number of dollars over X number of time that's specified, identified, deline- delineated. And so therefore, I'm going to pay you for your services. That's a certain sense of responsibility that comes with Shomer Sachar. If I'm paying you, you have to follow through. But then the Gemara tells us there's something called a Shomer, shomer Chinam. What's a Shomer Chinam? A Shomer Chinam is that I'm doing it for free. Now, what are the differences between Shomer Sachar and Shomer Chinam? Of course, there are quite a number. But the most compelling distinction is whether or not a person is obligated in a situation where there's a certain act, such as Geneva, where there's some type of Aveda, something is lost or something is stolen, something is no longer in the place that it was originally uh, left. So now if it's a Shomer Chinam, so what do you want from me? I simply am doing you a favor. You can't hold me responsible. Did I take responsibility? Should I ha- be held responsible? Shomer Chinam tends to be a little bit of a lighter load of obligation because I'm simply doing you a favor. I'm paying you, obviously, then you should be held higher level of responsibility. But in this case, he was none other than a Shomer Chinam. Now, this fellow who was watching this article, this chefza, for somebody, he understood this meiser, keach, these sources, that you keep your door open, and he doesn't lock his door. He didn't keep it totally, completely open a jar, but he kept his door unlocked. Avram, and this is, as I mentioned, there's a Magen Avram in Simit Tov Pehei, Pei Aleph, Sivkot and Beis, Shekosov HaMaril. And in the writings of the Magen Avram, he writes and quotes the learning of the Maharil. What's a chazak? Chazak is a uh, like a deadbolt. So the Maril says that here's an expression of your faith in God. You have to know what Leil Seder is. You don't lock your door, Bedelis, your door, Bavriya Chazak. Now, well, we can be mashma from that. We can infer from that. Does it mean that it's only Bavriya Chazak, like a strong deadbolt? That's what you shouldn't do. What if you just want to stop lock your doors? Or do you have to really leave your doors open? Seems that he's talking about specifically a deadbolt. But the Magen Avram suffices to say, quotes this Maril that says that on Pesach night, see, I've got a lot of locks on your door. Don't do them all. Just do a basic little, you know, that little knob switch that you're going to turn in a different direction 
from vertical, horizontal, however yours is set. And then you're going to lock the door. You don't need to put all the chains. You don't need to do all of the deadbolts, locking the door in a bivriya chazak in a strong way. What happens though? What happens? Lo and behold, just his luck. So the, he has holding something in his house on behalf of somebody else. That night he leaves his door open. Maybe he left his door open completely. We'll see is there a difference. Even if he just left it open, with, even if he locked it just lightly, but he didn't deadbolt it. But nonetheless, there were Ganovim, there were thieves that came and they actually stole the article that was held in this person's house. So now the question is, Haim, is it so... Is it that we say, again, there's a difference between if a person is poshea, if a person's poshea, he was negligent. If a person's negligent, if a person should have been more careful, that's one let of law, set of laws. But if a person was an oinus, a person was not an, a, a poshea, a person was not negligent, he was simply, he's a shomachinam without any connection strings attached. So maybe it could be that he's potter, he's exempt. He's asking this question. He wants to know. This guy comes to collect his article. <coughs> he comes after Pesach and says, okay, where's the hat? Where's the cloak? Where's the garment? Where's the, the files that I had you stay, stay in your house that I had you watch for me? He says, I'm sorry, they were stolen. He says, what do you mean they were stolen? You have to pay for that. You were poshea, you were negligent. So he says, I wasn't poshea. So that's what he wants to know. He's asking the Rav. He wants to know. Is it that he's putter from paying? Because after all, he wasn't poche, he wasn't negligent. He was simply following what he was supposed to do. Shahare nag kidivran amaril. He was just following what the Mogadav Ram quotes is the custom of the Maharil. The Maharil says you don't dead bolt your door. It's different. If you don't dead bolt your door, you're obviously maybe it means that there's a possibility that somebody's going to come in. And if there exists that possibility that somebody's going to come in, so why should he be held responsible? He shouldn't be held responsible. He's simply saying, he's arguing that, what do you want from me? I'm just following halacha. Or that's one possibility. No, no, maybe he really still has an obligation because it's not, it's a good idea. It's a nice thought. It's a nice, you know, practice. If you want to have some way of expressing how you feel that the night of redemption, Lil Shimurim is manifest, nice idea. Okay, but at the end of the day, the reason why they had entry into your house is because the door was unlocked. Now, obviously, there's a difference between unlocking and a deadbolt, but we'll assume that part of how he understood the Maharil is that he left his door open, he made it easy for people to access it, and suffice it to say, even though there's an opinion that says that you don't have to, but the, the, the reality is it's a it's a it's a result, there's a cause and effect, the result of you leaving your door more easily accessible to outsiders, intruders, in this case, Ganovim, they come into the house, they steal what they wanted to steal, so is it just the bottom line, the door is open, or as long as I can hang my hat on some type of rabbinic source, and that rabbinic source is sufficient, so then do we say it's just black and white that it's okay, he's potter, he's exempt, or do we say that no? So, Lamaisa, Sof Kol Sof, the door was open, the door is easily breachable, and so therefore he's held responsible, and so therefore he's chayv l'sholim. Do we say it just matters by what's on ink, or does it matter other variables as well? Okay, before we get to the answer, any questions, thoughts, comments? Yeah. Um, so, Rabbi, uh, to me, it seems that the issue is what did the person understand the custom in the community was? Um, so, for example, if this opinion of the Maharal was accepted, everybody leaves their doors unbolted, and then that individual should know, okay, I'm leaving this object with you, and I understand. Um, or he was told specifically, by the way, it's my custom on say tonight to leave the door unbolted, then, um, you know, that's one thing. But if there was no expectation that this person would be leaving the door unbolted, it's the same as if I lease a car from a finance company uh, and they expect me to fulfill my obligations to maintain the car and to keep it safe and secure. So if I park in a parking lot and I leave all the doors and windows unlocked and the keys in the ignition, they can then come say to me, you're not keeping up your end of the bargain, you are negligent, and they would be right. Uh, so, because that's really not the nahog, that's not the custom in our community of how you handle someone else's property. So I think what's important here is what is the understanding of the individual who's leaving the property with this person? Um, 
is this something that the whole community does? He should have known, or he was specifically told, by the way, not everybody does this, but this is what I'm going to do. I leave the doors unlocked. Are you okay with it? Right. And then like leave it up to him if then he decides I'm going forward with it anyway. But you have to make right. everything very clear. It's like the it's the small print in the contract. It's yeah. understood that you're not going to leave your doors open, the key in the ignition with a big sign, take a ride if you'd like at your discretion and bring it back with no tires and you know, slashed leather seats. And then go back to the dealer and say, okay, here's your lease back. Here's your car back. The lease is, is terminated, obviously. That goes without saying. But there are, I'm sure, other areas of, of those uh, nuances that are delineated in the small print. This is the small print. I'll, I'll tell you what's interesting about that is that do we expect when there's some type of a law that I have an obligation to tell you something that maybe you should have on your own no, like how well known is this and how much maybe that doesn't matter? How much could that potentially matter? If somebody says, listen, you know, we're arguing this case in a based in. The guy says, listen, uh, what do you want from me? I thought it was a well-known mug of rum. I thought it was a well-known halacha. I thought it was just a definition. <laughs> it says, Leil Shemurim. And even if you didn't know it, so maybe I shouldn't have an obligation to have told you, I have to tell you everything about, you know, you know, I mean, th this can go into so many different areas here. Like, what about, like, what is, whose responsibility is it? Is it the responsibility of the, of the person whose home it is to tell this fellow all of the minhagim, the customs, the things that I do, and therefore you should make your decision? Or is it this person who should say, listen, this is very important to me, and I just, I'm going to hope you're going to be extra careful, especially that maybe it's Leil Shimurim, and therefore it was like a, a regular Tuesday night, maybe not, but maybe because of the fact that there's a level of, you know, knowing something about Leil Shimurim, I'm not sure. We're just, we're, we're talking about that. I'm just thinking uh, in many areas, like, let's take a shul, take a home. Somebody comes to, uh, you know, a school, you know, now today there's nut-free environments now because, you know, of the food allergies. Who is the onus of that responsibility on? Is an onus a responsibility that exists on the shoulders of the school, the administration, to in literature and, 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 and functionally be sure to it that the place is safe so that the children who might potentially have a nut allergy do not come expo become exposed to that or not. Like who's responsible or is it the responsibility of the family? I was at a ball game pre-COVID with a number of my, my siblings and one of my, uh, two of my nieces and nephew have very severe peanut allergy. And it happens to be that there were a couple people that were, this is when people were sitting close to each other. So there was people, you know, eating peanuts at a ball game. And you know, they, that's what you do at a ball game besides watch a ball game. And it's not like they were putting their, 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 uh, trash their waste in a nice little waste paper basket. They were throwing it on the floor. Kemosha Kosov, like 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 against the Minig is in, in various stadiums. And uh, all of a sudden, like that, everybody got all nervous and they touched the seats and they touched the, they smelled they smelled the the the, the, the scent of it. So is the responsibility on the place? Is the responsibility on the person? That's one thought. The second thought is. We actually have this that relates very much to the time period we're in right now, not just the pre-Pesach time period we're in, but, you know, when we change the calendar, the change the clock, rather, in the calendar time of year where we find ourselves. So Shabbos now is later, according to the Zman. So now that introduces a whole set of laws as it relates to what does it mean early Shabbos? When do you make an early Shabbos? Can you make an early Shabbos? But here, more obviously, we know the answer to those questions are all yes. But here's what's interesting. What happens if the, the entire community decides to make an early Shabbos. Can you decide to make a late Shabbos? And the answer is no. You have to be together with the community. There's a level of common understanding that there's a like-mindedness like, like -mindedness that has to be done. And there's a lot of different parts of that. Today, since there's not a universal accepted time when everybody accepts Shabbos, when it's past this, you know, we change the clocks, we make it very late. So we give people an option. But I can tell you, it's not always so comfortable. It's not always so easy. There's a lot of different parts of that. So for example, this past Friday afternoon, I was in shul working, you know, towards the later part of the afternoon. And I was actually still working on my, uh, my Shabbos, I go to Drosha Shabbos after Friday afternoon. And I was planning on davening for a variety of different reasons in the later minion, the Zman minion. But at that point, when I left, so the early minion had already started. So it's very uncomfortable here. I walk out of my office. I, <laughs> the rabbi jumps into his car. 
I'm holding my, you know, I'm jumping the car. I'm holding my computer. I'm waving to people are waving to me. So I, I, I wave back. I'm, I'm wondering not so much about the, the religious people that are inside the shul. But of course, what if there's one who's a little bit not so sure, first timer? What's the rabbi doing? Like he's driving on Shabbos, chas v'sholem. The guard, I'm wondering, like, rabbi, he's like, I actually explained it to him because I wanted him to not think that there are services that are going on and the and I'm rabbi, you know, not participating in this in the services. I was actually I took my tie off at that part of the day, and here I'm like with that tie off. I'm wearing my holding my computer. I'm driving my car, and I'm waving to the people and showing good Shabbos, good Shabbos. Like if you were like a fly on the wall and you didn't know what was happening, it's like, hold on, like whoa, what just happened here? Like there's some type of mega urida. So that obviously wasn't the case. So it's it's not too dissimilar when, you know, obviously there are different cases, but there's, there's a, a level of, at some point, a person's ability even to make an early Shabbos or a late Shabbos is compromised. That right is taken from them if there is a universally expected understanding, even in the world of Kabbalah Shabbos. So whether or not that applies to laws like this or minhagim like this, is it just minhagim? Again, obviously it is a minhag because you have a pasuk and chumash with different interpretations of what leo shimura means. We use these words, but we don't necessarily apply these words to practice. People have a practice. We open the door for shifa chamascha, leo and navi, but you know, we don't necessarily leave it open. We obviously have different customs as it relates to dead bolting and things of that sort. I don't imagine that many of you leave your doors open. And if you, if you lock your doors, I'm sure you lock them probably like you do throughout the course of the year. But it's an interesting question. Like who would be poshea? Who would be negligent? Is the negligence on the person who's the homeowner that's holding the picadon or is the negligence on the person who wants the article to be watched? I just want to be sure that the house that I'm eating at doesn't have nuts, doesn't have whatever allergies I'm allergic to. I want to make sure that the house that, that I'm going to, is it too unknown of a law? Is it too unfamiliar? Or are there too many different interpretations of what that means? Or does it matter where you live? You know, it, it, what, what if I told you, you know, like, listen, obviously the difference between the car example that you just gave of driving your car in an identified area that's like a hoodlumville, right? It's shchiach. It's recognized with common understanding that if you leave your door, your doors open with the key in the ignition, you're not going to find your car again. But I'd be wondering and curious of what would happen if you did that in Boca Grove or what if you did that in Estancia South? So because the fact that it's not shchiach, there was a time, unfortunately, maybe some of you remember that over the past number of years, there were thieveries that were happening in Boca Grove. I wouldn't call it shchiach, but it definitely wasn't comfortable. It was definitely recommended. I remember a, a, a statement went out to homeowners. They should lock your doors. Don't keep your keys. Because people were doing that behind, behind the gate. They felt like your keys are unnecessary. You can actually leave your, you know, your keys in the car. You can leave your doors unlocked. So who's poche of that? Is it just because if you're, if you're behind the gate, you could say to the guard, what, are you doing your job? You go to both groups and say, well, do your job. What do you, you know? Somebody called me up about two months ago. And they said, Rabbi, you know, somebody's coming to our house in Boca Grove. They're knocking on our door and it's not right. Like we have to stop it. Can I call this family and tell them not to knock on the door? Everybody deserves their privacy, which by the way, I did because I felt that this family and every family deserves their privacy. But I'll simultaneously tell you that I called the Boca Grove security also. I myself, because I have a relationship with them, I call Boca Grove security also. And I said, I'm staying. Like, listen, I'm happy to call. I'm happy to help you. And please feel free to reach out anytime. But you got to do a good, a better job of making sure that people who aren't supposed to be in there aren't in there. You got to really do it. So, of course, the next three times that I walked, that, that I came into Book Grove, they like put me through. Like, if I tell you, they put me through the the mill. Let me see your ID and your passport and every document that I want to. I was like, come on, come me a break. If you're going to call and make sure that, like, I kind of like got busted. But I guess it depends. On if you, it's all a function of how you look at it. Right. So you're saying so sort of the same idea about the peanuts. So was this guy supposed to say, by the way, in this town, do we have to worry about being robbed in the middle of the night? Because there are places you go, I'm not sure now, but we've visited places where in the town, people go out of town, leave their doors open in case their neighbor needs something. So uh, is it incumbent upon that person to have said, what, what place am I living in? Yeah, I think so. I think so. On some level, we have to figure, there's got to be some level of communication. That's the question, really, actually. Does some level of communication become necessary to this conversation insofar as that I expect you to know something or you roll the dice as you roll the dice, especially if I'm a Shomer Chinam. A Shomer Chinam is a different category. I'm doing it. 
I'm doing it out of the goodness of my heart. I'm being kind. I'm being generous. I'm being, you know, free and willing to watch your your article without charging you. So, okay, so like if things work out, good. If they don't work out, it, it, all right. I didn't, I didn't mean for that to happen. If they stole your car in front of my house. I say, keep an eye on that, that rabbi. I'm like, sure, no problem. I, I come back. Hey, where's my car? I don't know. I was in my office learning. I was doing, I don't know. So that I mean, you're responsible. You're poshea. So are you are you considered negligent? Are, is it understood or do you have to be very, very clear? Now, obviously, in a given ideal world, everything's clear. Lots of times when you have, you know, medi- mediation or arbitration or, you know, legalities of confrontation, right? Machlokis between people, it's because things just were not spelled out. Things were not clear. Expectations were for one party A, whereas for party B, there was something else. And you get into a lot of different problems. Obviously, the more that's clarified, the more that's necessary to be clarified, clearly can help avoid this situation. The question, though, is Alpi Allah, what's obligated? This happens. There's a Geneva in the house. The article was lost. Who's held responsible? What do you do? So that's what we're going to you know, discover with some of these, these parts. And these questions are very essential because they're actually very practical, really very practical. And, and, there's, and there's status changes, not just if you're on social media, you have a status, status change. But you could be living in a, town, in a place, a subdivision like Boga Grove. And in one instance, it's not Shechiach. And in, a, in another instance, it is Shechiach, right? Which means in one area, it, in one instance, in one time, in one Tkufa, it is very common for there to be thieveries and in one area they got it under control and you'll be you'll, you'll let your guard down a little bit that's like just the way of the world how much of the up to the times do you have to be to change your your course okay that's where we're set up so so listen to this and this is a very interesting distinction because actually in some way we'll see that both avenues are true but we'll see what that means okay so now we're on the next page so she'el zusi he asked this question was brought to rebel yashiv amongst the others as well so he explains the following. This is a great answer. He says, who am I to say that? But I, it's, a, it's a meaningful answer. He says, Divrei ma'aril. You have to know, when you think about this ma'aril, it, it, it's not like you have different halachas in Shulchan Aruch, right? You have different halachas in Shulchan Aruch, which are what we're going to call them like baseline halachas. The Shemon Esrei, the Shema, keeping kosher, basic interactive tefillin, tzitzes, mezuzah, Shabbos. Those are the basics. Then there's certain mitzvos. Halachos, which are halachos, which are minhagim, but then he calls them, these are inyonim ramim v'nisgovim. What does ramim v'nisgovim mean? It means they're like on a lofty level. They're very high. That they're, they're, they're achievable to a person who wants to achieve them. But we wonder, are these halachos, are these hanhagim, are these practices that everybody's expected to do? Or are these ex- ex- you know, practices that if you can reach them, Go for it. But if you can reach it, okay, so we're not going to hold you responsible. Now, I'll tell you what comes to mind. You know, during the Aser Simei Tshuva, for example, there's a halacha, there's one halacha in Shulchan Aruch about Aser Simei Tshuva. What's that halacha? And that's not eating pas palter. Pas palter is bread that is manufactured by a non-Jew, an Enu Yehudi. You have to eat pas Yisrael during the Aser Simei Tshuva. Now, Mr. Bruce says, one second, I don't think that most people are going to keep that after the Aser Simei Tshuva. It doesn't matter. It's a very important time to elevate yourself. And even if it is that you're not going to do it after, it's a minig in class. It's a very strong minig. It's a, it's a high level. Everybody recognizes, even the Mishnah Brewer recognizes, a very high level. And even though there's some people that only eat Pasi Sro throughout the course of the year, most people don't. Most people will go to Winn-Dixie Publix and eat a Freehoffer's you know, sliced bread or whatever the brand is that has a kosher symbol on it, but it's not manufactured by a Jew, by a, by a, a Yehudi. It's manufactured by an Enu Yehudi. So, okay, that's a high level, but it's very temporary. It's very s- circumstance. Is this in this category? No, it's, it says the Rebel Yashiv in this response and this tshuva, this halachic quandary says, you should know that this level of the Maharil, if these are the, the category of Ramim, Nisgovim, these are high levels you have to really be a be a bal you have to be a bal you have to really be a person who has trust that's a different level. Is everybody expected to keep your doors open Pesach night? Okay, maybe it's a nice idea. Maybe it's a goal to to, to yearn for, to to strive for, to want to achieve one day. The amurim lechol adam shekach yinag bebeso. You should know this was said. This law, this custom, rather, was said. These words, the chol adam shekach. It's if a, how you want to be knowing in your house, be knowing in your house. It, it's not said for everybody. You all have to do it. And you have to do it for everybody. You have guests in your house for Pesach, right? So there's something that changes if you have guests in your house for Pesach. 
a lot of things change. <laughs> for example, you know, maybe when nobody's in your house for Yantif, you're going to walk around the dining room, the living room, wearing your pajamas, for example. You might not be dressed for the occasion. If you have your brother-in-law and your sister-in-law, your nieces and nephews, and even if you have friends, extended relatives, you're, not, you're going to maybe not put your, your, your night attire on before you go into your bedroom. That's one example of many. You're not going to keep, you're going to, you're going to have your food out in a different way. You're going to have, when you have guests in your house. So it might not be that it's different. Just because you want to take on a certain stringency, a certain chumrah, a certain add-on, that's good for you. And that's how he explains what this maharil is coming to say. You want to keep your door open? Fine. That's you. You want to be extra stringent for your property, for your things. You got an expensive watch. You have svarim. You have keys. You have things that are heirlooms, things that are important to you. And if it's still im kol zeh, you still want to keep your door open? Good. We're talking for you. That's on you. But lo. Then anything that's for you, anything that's your property. But you should know. This is not for you to be strict and stringent on somebody else's dime. Stringency, actually I said, I gave an example of one of, one of the examples of my Shabbos Agodal Drosher last night, was the, the story of the Berdichever, where the Berdichever was unable to bake his matzos one year because he was ill. And his Hasidim said, Tell us, Rebbe, what area are you stringent? What are you strict? Because we'll be strict like you're strict. So he says, I'll tell you where I'm the most strict. I'm most strict when it comes to their elderly women who work, work in the bakery. They're under a tremendous lachatz, tremendous pressure. It's easy probably for a person to be because they're in so much haste to feel that pressure if you express anger at them. So that is the area that I'm most strict. I don't express anger at them. I don't show anything besides love and appreciation. I'm strict about that. To be strict about your own chumras and place that upon somebody else, that isn't the purpose of chumras. And there's so many different examples, so many different examples. First of all, we don't have an obligation to be strict for somebody else. For somebody else to follow halach, okay, that's kol yisrael arevim zeb zeb mitzvos. But as far as being stringent and strict in chumras on behalf of somebody else, this says, Rebel Yashav, this is a stringency for you. You want to do it, no problem. But for somebody else's articles, your articles make them vulnerable. Us, other people's articles, you have no right to make other people's articles vulnerable. But that's part A. Part B is, even in a situation, and I guess this is side, tangential to it, even in a situation where something's a chumra ba'alma, just a stringency, Sometimes what happens is that people keep stringencies even erroneously. For example, let's just say you have a stringency, a minhug, but that minhug is not like a doraisa. A uh, perfect example, I think I've shared this with you before, is that I personally am nohig, and I say that word carefully, nohig, uh, to, to, to watch and only eat shomer, to, to eat chal of Yisrael, to only eat milk that's manufactured by a, a Jew. Have I shared this before? My birthday every year, my mother buys me, she did, till, till she, the secret was out, buys me a, a Carvel ice cream cake. My wife always tells me, I think I told this girl, so you don't have to eat the whole cake, you could just have like a little bite. One's a Doraisa, one's a Minhug, every time. And like, I guess secretly, I wasn't sure if I ever wanted my mom to stop buying me that, that Carvel cake. All right, that's a conversation for another time. Point is, is that my stringency doesn't have to then, you know, arrive at your doorstep. That's what I mean. Avalo kishemachzik pigodon shel hazulas should sarich. What you need to do, sarich lisholo so imaskim linahog kach. You homeowner have to at least in this example. Now, whether or not this would apply to all other areas would be an interesting conversation, which could ensue. But at least for now, with this case, the homeowner has to say, okay, here, according to Meliashu's understanding of this Magad of Ram, who's quoting this Maharil. You have to understand, this is a high level. This isn't the level for everybody. You can't expect everybody to be on this level. And so therefore, if you're going to have a house guest, or in this case, if you're going to have somebody who's going to ask you to safeguard, to watch something, and even if it's going to be that you're a Shomer Chinam, which exempts you from cases of being Poshea, you are negligent because you're not being, you're not being paid for it. No problem. doesn't matter. The, the level of this and the nature of this is such that lishol also maskim linohog kach. You have to ask him or her if they're comfortable, if they're willing, if they're interested, if they're okay with what your plan is, what you're going to do. I'm going to unlock my door, and the door is going to remain. Do you still want to leave your chefza, your article, with me? 
Bichol od lo hiskim. Now, if he doesn't agree, now that means if you don't tell him or her, and it gets stolen, it seems that you're chayev, it seems that you're obligated. Bichol od lo hiskim, and if he's not uh, willing to agree to this, vigots, and what happens? Vinignav chayev l'shalom, and something was stolen, he has to pay. So, he doesn't agree. Now, what happens if he doesn't tell him? It seems as if not only is it he doesn't agree and he does it anyway, but even if it is that he doesn't tell him, maybe maybe there's a pshia, there's a negligence in that you didn't tell him. It's not just a negligence that you didn't keep the door locked. Like, I don't know if we're going to call that a negligence that you keep the door unlocked, because after all, there is a source that allows you to interpret Leil Shimurim as an opportunity to keep your doors unlocked. Is that being push? I don't know. Maybe the pshia is that you didn't responsibly tell the person that you're going to do this and let them be masculine, let them agree to it because that's your responsibility. Your obligation is to somebody else. You know, when you have somebody in your house, I've had a house guest for years and years for Pesach. And I had to, you know, teach my children the following. There was this house guest had certain chumras, certain Pesach chumras, stringencies. And I could have said, and I certainly sometimes on, on occasion felt this, you're in my house, and if, you know, my house is good enough, good. If it's not good enough, okay, there's a lot of other places you go for Pesach. I'm not telling you if to come to my house for Pesach. You have certain, str- what happens if you have a guest, they come to your house for Pesach, you know, I like this type of matzah, I like this type of hachan, I like this type of this, I don't eat kabrux. What do you don't eat kabrux? I <laughs> So don't come to my house, we eat kabrux. What, what, what do you want from me? I, I don't, I do not love you any less. No, so the answer is, is that I told my children, we, we buy the matzahs that this person likes, we buy the wine that this person likes. You know, obviously the Gebrux, non Gebrux, Shiloh is a different question. We don't change our men hugging, but we're very sensitive. When it comes to somebody else being in your house, you want to do anything and everything possible to make that person feel as comfortable as they possibly can feel. It's your house. Okay, it's not your house, but it's your house. And that means, your obligation, man's obligation is for his other person. And this is understood in the Gemara, Perka Mafkid, in the Bavas, we understand the significance of that Shaila, that Sugya. Now, obviously, what's the exception to this rule? There's always an exception. What's the exceptional situation? The exception here is, Obviously, it depends, like Daki said, if the place that you're living or the place that you drive your least car is an obvious, recognized place that the car is going to be stolen or it, by leaving your doors open so obviously something's going to be stolen so then to low then low some china anisa obviously you're not supposed to leave your doors open then obviously whether or not you have to say something or not say something is different because it's understood I, you, you live in the middle of 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 brutal you know downtown brutalville wherever that is right and downtown Brutalville, which is dangerous, you're not going to leave your doors open. That because on anything for that matter is going to be stolen. So then a person doesn't do that. And as it relates to this minhug, as it relates to this custom, as it relates to this concept, even though the Magen Avram quotes the Ma'aril, even though it's a lofty level, a person can say, okay, I don't care. I want to be on this lofty level. The fact that you live in a dangerous neighborhood, we still apply other concepts, which mean, which are ain't You don't act like a tipus. You don't act like a fool. You don't act like you're negligent to basic common sense. And basic common sense is if it's not safe, you're not going to do it. Basic common sense extends to if somebody's not comfortable. If somebody in your house is not comfortable, they're not comfortable. We know that a person can be putter from the midst of yeshivas or yeshenas sukkah, sleeping or sitting in sukkah, if they're not comfortable. Now, obviously, it has to be within uh, you know, a, a level of sanity. Now, you can't easily pull that card you know, from your treasure chest. But suffice it to say, a person's not comfortable. Or if obviously it's a place that's shriach, that's defined, that's recognized, the place that's going to have a thievery problem, then we apply the concept of Ein Lanes, Avram, as the Magen Avram likewise teaches and says, nice idea, lofty practice, go for it, but just do it in consideration of the person, the guest, in consideration of the pikadon, of the article, in consideration of the place and the location that you live, the time and the space. And if you're able to do it, good. And if not, also good. It's also halacha. Now, does this apply to other areas, whether it's Shabbos, early Shabbos, Tosefa Shabbos, does it apply to the subdivisions like Boca Grove, Estancia South, various others? Obviously, if you take it case by case, 
noting that there are certain situations such as this concept of keeping the door open, Leo Shimurim as an interpretation, it's being understood as a madrega a rama, a level, a high level that might not necessarily be to the interpretation. That's not how Rashi understood. That's not how others understood what Leo Shimurim means. There are those who do understand Leo Shimurim, but it's not universal. You want to do it of the Maharal's liking and his, exp- and his explanation? Givaldic, it's great. It's certainly a level to achieve and a level to try to aspire. You want to be a Baal Bitochan, a Baal Emunah, that you trust God, that you'll leave your doors open, but you can't be a fool. You can't do it in a sense of, of irresponsible negligence. And obviously that would be a different, a, a different conclusion, a difference of whether or not one's chayv or one's putter. So in this case, so the conclusion of this story is that he's that if he didn't say anything, it'd be chayv. If he did say something and then it was stolen, then it would be that he's putter because that was a custom that the fellow agreed to. And therefore, different from in a situation where he was a shomer sachar, and even though he agreed to it, if he agreed to it and it was still stolen, he's still chayv. In this case, if he agrees to it and it's stolen, he's putter because he's a shomer chinam. He's a just, you know, a watchman who's willing to do it without cost, without, without charging. In that case, it all depends on this conversation. And if the conversation is with like-mindedness, a level of mindfulness between two parties, so then it says all that, all, all that needs to be said as relates to who's obligated or who's putter. Okay? I think it's an interesting case. No, and obviously it has um, a lot. To- I, I have a question. Yeah, please. So it this all makes sense um, if it's kind of an immediate situation. So let's say somebody leaves something with you and, you know, and is gone for we'll say months and months and, you know, and you're just, it's at your house and you almost forget that it's there, right? It's just part of your house. And then, so you, you don't even think about asking the person, is this okay with you? Because it doesn't, you don't remember, it doesn't occur to you. It's just been there for the longest time. Or maybe the person is away. There's no way to contact the person. Is it still, I mean, still your obligation or like, how does that work out? Yeah. Yeah, that's why these types of things are ideal when they're when there's an understanding of what they are. You know, when w- things get murky when it's not clear. You know, in situations like the past year that we've just experienced, people were unable to re- relocate themselves to places that they would have preferred to locate themselves, or there are things that were held in people's homes over a period of time. Sure, you know, at, at some point, I actually recently I just came in contact with such a similar case. I, I had one of my sisters in law years ago we're holding some files from when i was a rebbe in yeshiva that i had some files and i recently i asked my wife do you know where those files are and she said she thinks that maybe she i don't know, put them in Seamus or we, uh, she thinks maybe she came back to me i don't know where they were At, i mean how there was like 15 20 years ago like what it, do, does it clock out right is there something called a statute of limitation vis-a-vis how much a person can do it the answer is um, sometimes, I guess on some level, but not necessarily. If that person is expecting you, th- there are no terms of your being a Shomer Chinam unless you identify terms. And therefore, if it's left in your possession, you have to really you know, try to be as clear and as, and as, and as uh, remarkably, um, I don't know, on the same page with somebody. So this way, that type of situation doesn't happen. But sure, you, know, you could always argue that, where have you been? Now you're arguing, listen, there are lots of people who decide they wake up and they realize that there's certain things that somebody should be responsible for, but that's not something that I knew about. I didn't even remember. I didn't even know that I had that. At some point, what, what plays into that conversation, Carol, it's a good question, is, is something called uh, the halachic status of being miyayish. What's miyayish? Miyayish means I've given up all hope for it. So, uh, Because you could ask your question even a little bit differently, which is what happens if you know, you're, you're cleaning for Pesach and all of a sudden, lo and behold, you find this like very important something, right? You find a ring that seems to be very valuable that, oh my goodness, 35 years ago, I remember this person gave it to me to watch. Why haven't they picked it up? Where have they been? So, on, so when we can determine that a person was miyayish, which means they gave up hope from it, they never thought they'd ever get it back, the halachic status of something that one relinquishes hope of ever getting back is that it's called hefker. It's permissible. It's, it's, it's ownerless. And if it's ownerless, I can pick it up. And one of the distinctions between what becomes ownerless or not is whether or not that thing has a sin on it, a sign on it, or whether that person over time must have given up on it. The likelihood, if you find that ring, they probably gave up on it, right? 
if, if it's somebody that's that's a friend or lives far away or you've lost contact with, probably probably they've given up on it. And so therefore, the, the I mean, you have to go case by case, but probably it's Hefker and it's ownerless and therefore it could be yours. That's the difference between money that you find on the street and money that's in a wallet that you find on the street. Like if you find a hundred dollar bill, you're, you know, you're coming out of Starbucks and you're walking to your car and by at the, at the foot of the tire, you find that there's a hundred dollars, who does it belong to? So do I have to put a sign up at the outside? $100 found. You know what's going to happen? You've put a $100 bill. Ben Franklin was found, not the guy, but the Benjamin Franklin is found right outside Starbucks. To claim that $100, call 561, blah, 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 blah. You know what's going to happen? Everyone's going to say, oh, that was my $100. Prove it. I don't know. Didn't you say that it was by the tire? That's where I, I, I was. It's the second you find that it's yours. You could decide to put it in charity. That's up to you. But it's actually halakhically yours. If you find a money clip, you find a wallet, and if I, and there's money, so then there's, there's a sim and there's an I, identifier that changes the status. And then you'll say, okay, money was found. And you'll say, you know, call, here's the, with, with certain sim money, with certain signs, and here's the number to call. And, they, and if they can identify the signs, because there's no other way for them to have known, you know, it's a clip that has the initials RKG on it. And then, oh, you must be Rabbi Kenny Greenberg. And therefore, here is your, your your money clip. So that makes a big difference. So yeah, it is dependent on time and it does depend on the na- the nature of it. It does depend on relationship and it does depend on whether or not you were hired to do it or whether or not you were only to, interested in doing it for free. But good question. Okay. Rabbi, to, to take yeah. the opposite situation from the one I described, leaving your keys in the car, et cetera. What if it's known that in the, your community, everybody leaves their doors open. It's uh, I mean, when I remember when I was a kid, we used to go to the bungalow colonies in the Catskills. Everybody's door was open. I wanted to go see my friend. I never had to knock on the door. I just, I was a kid, you run in and uh, it was accepted that doors were left completely unlocked. So if it's known that that is the minhag hamakom, does that change the obligation of the person who's holding the object? It could, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. The bungalow colony analogy is a great analogy because that's like there is an understanding of that. Now, less less similar to that is like places where we live, right? So you might have people in your development or in my development who have a personality to allow that to happen, more of a free spirit, and others not. It really has to be very shchiach, and I think the best example is the bungalow colony where really everybody feels that's just like the energy of the Catskills. It's the energy of the people that are there, that shared space. Sure, if that was the understanding, it's shchiach, right? Everybody keeps Shabbos at the same time. If everybody made an early Shabbos and you came in, made a late Shabbos, you, you, right. you're, you're outside of the norm. So yeah, sure. In that situation, you wouldn't necessarily have to tell everybody because of at the end of the day, that's what everybody does. <clears throat> if it's done for, a, a, meaning... If it's done for a reason like this because of Pesach and not everybody does it, or even if you want to do it, it's just for certain people who want to be on a high madriga, that's a different story. But it seems to me that if everybody does it, just like if it would be shchiach ein somchan al you shouldn't do it. If it's shchiach that everybody does it, so why not? People should do it. And, and what comes with that is if something happens, come on, what do you mean? We've been living in the bungalow colony for the past 30 years. We haven't had the door locked once. You've been popping in and out of my house from... The beginning of time, by the way, I'm sure that's happened. I'm sure it's happened in the bungalow colonies where people have lost things or things have been stolen. Mm-hmm. So say, okay, and I'm curious. I could do a little bit of research on that. I'm curious if there's ever been a, bin, a din tower that they say, what do you what do you want from us? It's shriach, but no, things are not. Uh, and, and it might be that part of your buying to a bungalow colony. Yeah, I remember there was somebody who was telling me they, they rented a place, not this summer, the summer before, they rented in a bungalow colony where it was like that and they were very uncomfortable. Someone in our community, <clears throat> the, the husband was very uncomfortable. The wife loved it because that she, she wanted, and so he just felt, so he was wondering, is there a buy-in? Do you have to know about that? You know, when you buy into yeah. a development, you like know what you're buying into. Like, <laughs> and if you never signed that, do you have to sign that? Do you have to verbally express that? Do you have to mentally recognize that? And maybe if there isn't that, it's just kind of like the, we call it the Heimish understanding of what it is. This wife, she was like, pardon the expression, like a pig in mud. She loved it. She just could not get enough of it. He, this guy, he said, he's like, he said he had to walk around dressed. He couldn't go into his own bathroom. He couldn't like make his own food. There was somebody at his refrigerator. He said he couldn't get wait, wait to get out of the Catskills. Some people like that. Some people like that. <laughs> and other people, 
I don't know, like there's some people, you know, when you, you say guests are coming over, everybody like runs to the door. And there's some people, oh, there's someone at the front door, everybody hits the deck. Everybody's like, let's hide. You know, let's let's get out of town. Let's let's hide under the covers. Everybody is, has their, uh, their their uniquenesses and their personalities that play very much a part of this. Okay. Awesome. Great. Thank you. We're up to the top of the Thank you both. Thank you all. Thank you to our generous sponsors. Love this Monday morning sacred time. Yeah. We're together. Hope this week preparing for Pesach is smooth and easy. And most importantly, I hope it's very meaningful. Stay safe. Stay healthy. Stay well. Thank you guys. Thank you so much. For Thank you very me. much. Bye. Thank you. Bye.